Hello, my name is Professor Shiladitya Rakshit. The name of the module is the 1949 Geneva Conventions and Additional Protocols of 1977. Let us look at the module overview. This module will discuss the common as well as specific provisions of the four Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. Discuss the relevance of the convention in the contemporary international law regimes. Learning outcomes. The learning outcomes of this module is to give students an overview of the Geneva Convention and the additional protocols and the relevance in international humanitarian law. By the end of the module, students will have a clear understanding of the relevance and purpose of the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. Introduction The Contemporary Law of Armed Conflict, the LOAC, has formalized a set of rules governing actions of the states during war. Certain humanitarian rules are mandatory for all the states at the time of war. Even though international humanitarian law with respect to victims of war has been in place for a long time, the present day principles can find their base in the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and the additional protocols. In 1949, an international conference built up on the existing treaties for the protection of war victims revised them into four new conventions comprising of 429 articles viz convention 1 for the amelioration of conditions of wounded and sick in armed forces in the field convention 2 for the amelioration of conditions of wounded, sick and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea. Convention 3 relative to treatment of prisoners of war and Convention 4 relative to the protection of civilian persons in times of war. The Geneva Conventions immediately had a huge success. They entered into force already on 21st of October 1950 after the first two ratifications. They were ratified by 74 states in the 1950s and obtained a further 40 ratifications in the 1960s. The ratification steadily increased in the 1970s, 20 ratifications and 1980s, 20 ratifications. A wave of 26 new ratifications occurred in the early 1990s, resulting in particular from the breakup of the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia and the former Yugoslavia. With seven more ratifications post year 2000, the applicability of the Geneva Convention has today become universal with 194 states party. The Geneva Conventions are considered the foundation of modern humanitarian law. In 1977, the international community came up with two additional protocols, which dealt with protection of victims in international and non-international armed conflicts, in order to supplement the Geneva Conventions. Although Unlike the Geneva Conventions, the additional protocols do not have close to universal acceptance. They are still considered essential to customary principles of humanitarian law. Though the scope of these conventions applies to armed conflicts between one or more states, it also applies to conflicts between state and armed group where armed group possesses a certain degree of organization and violence in the conflict reaches certain level of intensity.
Each of these conventions has certain specific principles laid down along with general principles that are common in all of them. Now let us look at the general principles common in conventions. Irrespective of specific subject, matter and the nature of conflict, there are certain fundamental humanitarian rules that are essential to LOAC and have to be observed at any time. All parties off to a conflict are prohibited from activities such as torture, mutilation and cruel or inhumane treatment. Perhaps the most important provision of all four Geneva Conventions is Article 3, which is identical in all of them and extends the scope of the Convention to non-international armed conflict. It lays down a special case for people who are not involved in the hostilities, including horse de combat soldiers and those who have laid down their arms. It prohibits acts involving violence to life and person and murder, mutilation, cruel treatment and torture, taking hostages, outrage upon personal dignity, humiliating and degrading treatment and passing sentence and executing without properly constituted court or judicial guarantees. Article 3 also lays down the requirement of an impartial body to offer services to parties to a conflict for the wounded, sick and shipwrecked. Similarly, in the section of execution of conventions, all the four conventions provide for penal sanctions for general observation and grave breaches. Now, what are grave breaches? Grave breaches comprises of acts such as willful killing, torture or inhuman treatment, including biological experiments, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health against the persons protected by the convention. Depending on the convention, each has additional acts which could qualify as grave breaches. However, in principle, the penalizing structure is same for all the four conventions. Depending on the convention, each has additional acts which could qualify as grave breaches. However, in principle, the penalizing structure is same for all the four conventions. The emphasis of international humanitarian law or IHL on certain principles is pretty evident from the common clauses of the conventions. Let us now examine some of the specific provisions of each of the conventions and the protocols. Specific provisions. Convention 1 for the amelioration of conditions of wounded and sick in armed forces in the field, Convention 1. The first Geneva Convention in 1949 expands on the same subject matter, which was dealt with by the Geneva Convention of 1864. It targets the wounded and sick soldiers, medical, personnel and facilities, wounded and sick civilians, accompanying forces or those who spontaneously take up arms and military chaplains. The convention is divided in nine chapters, some of the specific provisions that constitute the substance of the convention are discussed in this section. Chapter 2 about the wounded and sick. Article 12 states that wounded and sick members of armed forces have to be respected and protected without any discrimination on the basis of sex, race, nationality region, political beliefs or other criteria. It also lays down that the wounded and sick shall not be murdered, exterminated or subjected to torture or biological weapons. Article 15 protects the wounded and sick against pillage and lays down requirement for search in order to collect 
and provide care for the wounded and sick. Chapter 3 to 6 talks about medical units, establishments, personnel, buildings and transports. Article 19 of Chapter 3 provides special protection to establishments and mobile medical units of medical service from any attack. Such protection does not cease to exist unless they engage in activities outside humanitarian duties to harm the enemy, Article 21. The medical personnel, auxiliary personnel and personnel of aid societies enjoy similar protection under Chapter 4 of the Convention. The medical transport and aircraft are required to be allowed to perform their functions of aiding the wounded. Then is the Convention 2 for the amelioration of conditions of wounded, sick and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea. The second Geneva Convention extends the humanitarian principles for armed forces to wounded and sick combatants at sea. The 63 articles in of the Convention aim to advance protection to wounded sick or shipwrecked armed forces members, hospital ships and medical personnel and civilians who accompany the armed forces. Some of the specific provisions are as follows. Chapter 2 is about the wounded, sick and shipwrecked. Article 12 of the Second Convention establishes similar standard of protection to be administered for those who are wounded, sick and shipwrecked at sea and those wounded on land, it requires humane treatment and proper care without any discrimination and prohibits any attempts on lives or violence on their persons. Further women shall be treated with the due consideration to their sex. Article 18 additionally states that parties are required to search for, collect and care for the shipwrecked. Neutral vessels can be asked for help to collect and care for wounded, sick and shipwrecked but they cannot be captured by virtue of being neutral. Warships are allowed to hold wounded, sick or shipwrecked as prisoners of war provided it has the facilities to care for them and they can safely move. Article 14. Chapters 3 to 5. Hospital ships, personnel and medical transports. This convention lays down that hospital ships, medical personnel serving on ship and medical transport ships cannot be attacked or captured. The names and description of the hospital ships must be conveyed to all the parties in conflict, Article 22, to avoid conflict. Article 37 and 38 provide for a separate protection for religious, medical and hospital personnel even serving on combat ships. Even in case such personnel are captured, they have to be sent back to their side as soon as possible. Then you have Convention 3 relative to treatment of prisoners of war. The third convention sets out specific rules for treatment of prisoners of war. An elaborate convention with 143 article, it lays down that POWs need to be treated humanely, receive sufficient food, clothing and medical care and should be adequately housed. It also establishes guidelines on discipline, labour and criminal trial for the POWs, some of the specific provisions include the general protection of prisoners of war. Article 12 to 16 states the requirement of humane treatment for POWs, respect of persons of prisoners, maintenance of prisoners, responsibility for treatment. POWs must not be subjected to torture or medical experimentation and have to be protected against violence, insults and public curiosity. 
Part 3 talks about captivity. Captors ought not engage in any reprisals or discriminate on basis of race, nationality, religious beliefs, political opinions or other criteria. Female POWs have to be treated with due regard to their sex. Hygiene and medical attention, quarters, food and clothing have to be sufficiently taken care of. Chapter 5 of part 3 discusses the religious, intellectual and physical activities of the prisoners. POWs can be made to work, however the convention also lays down the requirement for that. Section 3 part 3 sets out the minimum working conditions, pay and medical supervision of the labour along with prohibition of dangerous or humiliating labour. Section 5 of the same part requires the name of the prisoners to be sent to Central Tracing Agency of ICRC and POWs have to be allowed to correspond with their families and receive packages. On other occasions, the part enumerates on the judicial process that it needs to be ensured for prisoners' trials. Part 4 Termination of Captivity The Convention requires seriously ill POWs to be repatriated. Otherwise, after the conflict has ended, the POWs are to be released and sent home without delay. The captors are also responsible for making wills and death certificates in cases of death amongst POWs. The detaining authorities are responsible for honourable burial or cremation for the deceased POWs. Other than the responsibility of detaining authorities under various paths, the ICRC has special rights to carry out humanitarian activities on behalf of the POWs and have to be allowed by concerned parties to visit the prisoners privately and ensure that the Convention standards are met. Convention 4 relative to the protection of civilian persons in times of war. The fourth and final Geneva Convention focuses on civilians in areas of armed conflicts and occupied territories. Part 2 General protection of populations against certain consequences of war. Civilians must be protected from murder torture or brutality and from discrimination on the basis of race, nationality, religion and political opinion. The convention points out the need for hospital and safety zones for wounded, sick, aged, children, expected mothers and mothers of children under seven. The convention provides protection for civilian hospital staffs and care for children who are orphaned or separated from their families. Part 3 talks about the status and treatment of protected persons. Safety, honour, family rights, customs and religious practices of the civilians have to be respected in a conflict territory. Medical supplies and objects for religious worships cannot be restricted passage and the occupier is responsible to provide, maintain medical and public health facilities as necessary for the population. Articles 33 and 34 of the part have a collective effect of prohibition of acts such as pillage, reprisals, indiscriminate destruction of property and the taking of hostages. Section 4 of this part aims to ensure that civilians must be permitted to lead normal lives unless security concerns are present. Even if they are interned, their living conditions should meet a minimum standard with adequate food, clothing, medical care and protection from risks attacked with a war just like POWs, at the time of death, the internees have a right 
at honorable burial or cremation. The four Geneva Conventions could be described as unified efforts of the international community to ensure protection to all the stakeholders in a war, each dealing with a specific subject matter. The conventions were drafted in a way to accommodate for damage to all parties involved in a war. Then you have the additional protocols of 1977. The principles of humanitarian law never stopped evolving after the Geneva Convention of 1949. In 1977, the negotiations resulted in two additional protocols that intended to supplement the existing rules of the Geneva Conventions, though not all countries have ratified to the additional protocols, those have are still bound by all the provisions of the conventions, regardless of whether they have ratified the additional protocols or not. Protocol 1 is aimed to protect the victims of international armed conflicts. It brought up special protection for women, children and civilian medical personnel along with measures of protection for journalists. Destruction of dames, cultural objects, places of worship, food, water, other material of survival for civilians were all outlawed by the additional protocol 1. Some of the most important contribution of additional protocol 1 is restriction on target of attack. It disallows targeting civilians or civilian objects. Further, the protocol also prohibits use of indiscriminate attacks which affect both civilian and military targets without distinction. In addition to principles of distinction, the protocol expressly lays down the requirement of proportionality and precautions. It sets requirements for parties to only use alternative that causes minimum loss of life and property, while any other alternative would result in a violation of the protocol. The protocol realized the importance of restricting methods of warfare including weapons. It prohibited use of weapons that caused superfluous injury or unnecessary suffering or cause severe damage to the environment. Article 77 of the protocol prohibited recruitment of children under the age of 15 in armed forces. The additional protocol adds support to and clarifies the existing principles already mentioned in the Geneva Convention. Even without ratification, additional protocol has been accepted to represent customary principles of IHL and thereby wielding strong authority. Protocol 2, on the other hand, dealt with protection of victims of non-international armed conflicts non-international armed conflicts here does not include disturbances such as riots, demonstrations or isolated acts of violence. Protocol 2 prohibits terrorism, murder and cruel treatment, slavery, hostage taking, outrages on personal dignity, collective punishment and pillage. It advances the persons interned during international conflicts the same humane treatment as specified by the Geneva Conventions. Attacks are forbidden on civilians and on objects indispensable to civilian survival such as crops, irrigation systems or drinking water sources, cultural objects and places of worship. Other provisions include same humane treatment of persons interned or detained during internal conflicts as specified by the Geneva Conventions and evacuation of children to safe areas and to be reunited with their families. Even in internal armed conflicts, impartial humanitarian relief organizations cannot be restricted from doing their work. Then 
the significance of the Geneva Conventions in contemporary IHL. The Geneva Conventions of 1949 have attained virtually universal recognition. They have been accepted by more states than most of their conventions. Rather, a number of their rules have been recognized as customary rules and have received the status of just cogents. International humanitarian principles developed many folds over the past few decades. However, the starting shot that led to the acceleration of the movement is still attributed to the Geneva and Hague Conventions. The United Nations Security Council has set up two international criminal tribunals to prosecute people responsible for humanitarian violence, viz. the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. In addition to these, the International Criminal Court criminalizes violations of Geneva Convention under war crimes. It develops its jurisprudence on the existing interpretation of the Geneva Conventions. The importance given to human rights in defining humanitarian principles can be observed in the Geneva Convention 1949, following which the intermingle between the two regimes was recognized by the international community on various occasions. Therefore, it is not incorrect to say that the Geneva Conventions form the cornerstone from which the movement towards stronger humanitarian principles took place. Thus, in summary, it can be said in this module, we briefly went over some of the provisions of the Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols. We started with an introduction to the relevant protocols. We discussed the common features of all the four conventions, which included very important concepts of grave breaches of the conventions and more specifically, we dealt with Article 3, which defines certain activities as prohibited under any armed conflict. Then we discussed the main subject matters of each of the conventions separately. The first convention deals with the condition of wounded and sick members of armed forces. The second deals with wounded, sick and shipwrecked in the sea. The third deals with prisoners of war and finally, the fourth convention deals with protection of civilians. All of the conventions define protected personnel and protects medical and humanitarian services to be attacked, addition to after protection. Following them, discussed the two additional protocols 1 and 2, which protect civilians from international armed conflict and non-international armed conflict respectively. The additional protocols add, clarify the protection offered under the Geneva Conventions and define concepts. The principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution with respect to attacks are predominantly established and explained in the additional protocol and lastly, we were very briefly understood the relevance of Geneva laws in the current international humanitarian law regime. The Geneva Conventions not only form the cornerstone for modern IHL, but is also the most important part which forms customary IHL. Thank you.